very good morning to one and all gathered here it is my privilege to welcome each and every one of you who have joined today with us to attend this uh, cne program uh, this is the cne is one of the program which we are conducting as a part of breast care aware, uh, breastfeeding awareness week we have conducted series of program in this week uh, rural uh, awareness program and even in the urban health centers our people have gone our faculty and students have gone to create awareness among the uh, urban health center people as well as in the hospital also some awareness program were conducted we thought that for enrichment of the students based on the theme we will identify somebody uh, to talk about that so we have rightly identified uh, madam josephine uh, for giving a talk about the theme uh, welcome you madam very happy uh, to welcome you at this occasion of cne and i really thank for your immediate acceptance to be your resource speaker for this uh, cne before uh, she could start her presentation i just would like to introduce her she is working as a madam josephine francis savior is a nurse educator with a 24 years of teaching experience she is a nursing scholar and researcher with expertise in maternal and child health lactation promotion fatherhood and nursing education she is currently undertaking her doctorate degree in nursing at york university canada she is a lactation consultant at trillium health partners and she is working as a clinical instructor at university of toronto she has presented her research to audiences at national and international gatherings notably the gulf corporation council nursing conference south asian mental health work health network and the international infant feeding and nutrition conference her research interests include exploring the impact of covid-19 on fathers mental health social support for first time fathers south asian parents experience and immigrant parents experience using grounded theory and intersectional approaches Josephine Francis Xavier is a nursing scholar and researcher with extensive experience in maternal and child health, lactation promotion, and fatherhood. Her eclectic teaching philosophy prioritizes intersectional approaches, decolonization, equity, diversity, and inclusion principles, and inquiry-based instruction to promote critical thinking and clinical judgment. as a mentor josephine students consistently rate her highly for her teaching ability her professional accomplishments worth noting are the arthur and terry jane cooker endowment fund scholarship award by trillium health partners she has received in 2019 and she also has received a scholarship dr donald black professional development scholarship in 2017 by registered nurses association of ontario and she also has received advanced nursing practice fellowship in 2019 with this small introduction i now call upon and invite mrs josephine mary francis to present her topic about the breast cancer awareness theme as you have had um, over the past week i'm sure you had all mini sessions on this particular theme aligning towards world breastfeeding week if that is what i understand but then the world breastfeeding weeks theme for this year goes to making work work for breastfeeding so it's all about enabling breastfeeding for working parents so greetings to you our global audience and my special students uh who are there who are close to me i always love my learners because it's a great opportunity as an educator to learn together this is more than you listening to me i'm going to learn a lot from you so uh, i welcome you for this remarkable webinar that transcends across continents right now i'm sure it's at dawn there at 9:30 am and right now i'm just starting my day it's 12 midnight so as the clock strikes 12 midnight in toronto it's my pleasure to join you so as this first slide i'm sure most of my 
And my credits, I always give my images to WHO, UNICEF. This is where my images are coming from. And all my practical images of anything that you see is all from my practice arena, which is personally uh, captured by myself. So, so with no further disclaimers, I would move on to and uh, to my next slide. So, do we need superpowers to breastfeed while we return to work as students or as, I mean, breastfeeding mothers as students, that's not new. And although in our culture back home in India as students, it's very difficult to see um, students who are breastfeeding. Of course, we have masters and PhD students, whereas the culture where I come from, we have all students, even in post-secondary education, or we have secondary students who are breastfeeding mothers. So that's why this topic is of great choice. Now, coming to a spotlight on my passion as an LC, why did I start? Why, why am I a maternal and child health nurse? So a little bit to add, my journey definitely it's a balance. You can see these tones. It was definitely a juggle between uh, my profession and my role and my passion as I transitioned through my motherhood. I'm a mother and I'm a sister to my siblings. I'm the eldest in my family of six. And I have my, as I, I said, um, my passion to be a nurse and my passion to be an educator transcends to my generation families of teachers and I'm the first nurse in my family. This I bring to you because I have my students here to give that professional touch to it. And of course, my friends with no due respect to them. Now coming to my professional, I've definitely juggled through my professional career. I started off as an RN and I'm from Chennai where you are. I studied in Madras Medical College, my bachelor's and I did my master's in CMC by law. And then I moved on to Kuwait. Of course, I did my master's in OBG um, in um, CMC. And then I moved to Kuwait. And my um, fruitful years have been in Middle East in a different culture, the different set of students, very fruitful years. And then from there, I moved to Canada. And even before I moved to Canada, I certified as an LC. Why did I choose to become a lactation consultant? I'm a preemie. I was born 27 weeks. Would you believe it? In 70s, I was 27 weeker. I give praise to God. I give praise to my parents. I give praise to Kilpock Medical College, gynecologists, pediatricians who were great, who saved me. My great grandmother still date. I remember she tells me she placed me in a cotton ball inside a circular Holix bottle. I think she meant those circular incubators. That's what I assume. So that's where my passion goes to maternity, child health, and there to LC. And as a nurse, I mean, it relates back to why I chose nursing, to be an educator and to serve the people whom I serve as I am. So right now, I am a PhD scholar at University of Toronto. And in this picture, as you see, I have the great support, the father of my children, and I have my son who's past university, my daughter is entering university. So that's all about me. So I am here only with the support. And my journey in lactation, that's where I'm coming to. My first son was born in India. I worked in Savita at that point in time, but I had a very wonderful work culture there. I don't know how the maternal breastfeeding act was placed at that point in time in 1999, because the act did not really take into effect in a great swing at that point in time. But our principal was kind enough to post me in an area, ESI hospital, close to my house where I used to go during my breaks to feed my son. And my son was exclusively breastfed for one and a half years. Comparatively, when I moved to Kuwait, I had only one, 21 days of maternity leave. And although I was an OBG specialist, I was not really a specialist in lactation. So that's where the definition of IBCLC and lactation specialist comes. All of us know about breastfeeding, but there is a specialization that comes into effect. And I fed my daughter only for two months. I did not pump, I had to get back to work. So that's where is the challenge. 
So our supporter was my work culture back in India. Our supporter was my work culture back in Middle East. It's nothing to disrespect any continent or country, but then I'm just comparing what happened. Now, my son is in university. I would say the child was exclusively breastfed. He's such a sociable, well-adjusted, mentally well. I mean, I would say, I mean, it's nothing like putting one person or I'm not comparing both of my kids, but then I see a lot of difference in the emotional stability of both of my children. So that's what I bring to. So breastfeeding and the work culture that supports those initial years is very crucial, very critical for mothers. As a professional, as an educator, as a nurse, as a mother, I have experienced this. And that's why it's my pleasure when um, Dr. Helen asked me to speak about it. I said, I should add this personal touch to it. There's lots in the books. I, I need not bring everything that is there in the book. You can Google it and learn. But my personal experience, that is what matters here to add context to it. So why do we celebrate World Breastfeeding Week? Well, it goes back to World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action. And I was thinking, well, this is going on every year. It has started in the year 1991. It is a global network, that an organization that protects, that promotes and breastfeeding worldwide. But from 2019, for over 10 years, for 20 until 2030, though WABA has taken a theme for every year to enable breastfeeding across countries so that a consistable activities or consistent and considerable, um, I mean, to strengthen the activities of breastfeeding will be there across continents throughout the world. So as you see in this timeline that I put together, in 2019, they concentrated on activities that would empower parents individually. And in 2020, you would see that the theme was on preparing healthier planets. So breastfeeding is against, I mean, it is for sustainable health goals of planetary health. So the third goal in 2021, it was about shared responsibility. So breastfeeding is not only a mother's responsibility, but all of us, it's a social responsibility. I would talk more about that. So in 2022, it was all about educating and supporting mothers, all the caregivers, all the whole society. And they, here we are to enable breastfeeding to make a difference for working parents. And that's how they're going to progress towards the ultimate goal in 2023 to see what's the impact towards sustainable developmental goals to reach 50% of exclusive breastfeeding across the globe. So with that little note on that, now coming to the highest and the lowest breastfeeding rates. So according to UNICEF, so I've circled the significant things. It said that Less than half of all newborns around the world, that's around 47%, are exclusively breastfed during the first five months of their lives. Now, I, because I'm speaking to audience in India, definitely. Um, so South Asia, that's where we come in India, about among the seven countries of South Asian countries, India is one of them. But I was so proud to see this percentage and it's updated, although it is from 2021, but then it's been um, the sources from UNICEF 2022. So we are at 57%. Oh, wow. I was so happy about this percentage. But compared to where I am right now, North America, 26%. What is this difference? Oh, my. I was thinking North America, they have all the comforts. They have everything. Book, I mean, speak and span, everything is by book picture. And we do learn all our books are based from North America. And the, our paid leaves, our um, work policies are totally different compared to India or South Asia. And still, why is this 26% in comparison to 57%? What do you think? Well, you can think with me, no worries. So South Asia, 57%. I applaud my my native, my home country. The reason I am thinking in reflection, probably it's because of our culture, our generations, right? We give so much of value to breastfeeding. One, the second, we have a lot of social support. We have grandparents, we have mother, we have father, we have friends. We have so much of support. In North America, yes, there is individualism, right? And it is a choice. This is for good, this is for bad. Like 
in our country it's more of like it runs through uh, generations and i have heard of parents who come here as immigrants who say well it's enforced well they do not respect our choice so these are little comparisons which you could see the pros and cons so this is my reflection now coming to breastfeeding rates around the world you can see 46 percentage is the breastfeeding rate in india compared to other countries now so that's where we are but why 46 percentage in comparison to other countries so that is where the support to environment comes into play with that now failure to invest in breastfeeding will pay a double price this is the investment that each country around the globe needs to make if we do not invest in breastfeeding and we it is going to cost us a lot so according to the global breastfeeding scorecard by unicef and who they have found that among 194 nations in total we have some more three more nations i added so across the globe we have 197 nations and it is so sad to say that with so much of learning in breastfeeding awareness no country meets breastfeeding standards isn't that really heartbreaking but still but at least we are trying to move forwards only 40% of children younger than 6 months of age are given nothing but breast milk and among these 194 nations only 23 countries have exclusive breastfeeding rates above 60% and among the seven south asian countries we have nepal bangladesh and sri lanka who are exclusive breastfeeding rates are above 60% well i would see this number probably before 2030 i guess in that 60% above because we are almost there right 46 so we just have to go 16 i hope for the best so the this court card in their survey they say that this lack of investment in this low income countries which are growing economies over the next 10 20 years china india indonesia mexico and nigeria are because of the lack of investment because of the sidelining of breastfeeding attention they think breastfeeding can happen it's natural it's by default and but it's only for the individual it's individual's responsibility so moving away from the global responsibility to an individual responsibility thereby there's lack of investment in breastfeeding so that is estimated to cost 236000 child deaths per year which could cause the global economy a loss of about dollar 119 billion so in low income countries it is shown that only 250 million um or dollars is spent on breastfeeding promotion of which dollar 85 comes from donors so there's a less concentration and that's one of the reasons this this theme is very important for the year to come and for the future for the investment in breastfeeding now coming to investment for future is definitely a social responsibility so what should we be doing increase the funding well i can, you can think if i was there in that group long ago i might have thought well when i'm in my final year probably my uh, awareness should have been more because but in my first year i would have thought what am i going to do funding it's not in my hands that's the politician says definitely but that's where the awareness comes right so we have the businesses we have from from systems to structures and to enact paid family leave now coming to the paid maternity leave you can see in canada it's 50 to 52 weeks i'm not going to talk about different types of paternal i mean sorry by default my words are coming to paternity leave because i'm studying fathering and fatherhood so it's so much ingrained in my blood nowadays so in canada 50 to 52 weeks is the uh, paid maternity leave and in norway 44 weeks and in india we are 26 weeks now how do we invest for our future as a social as a society workplace breastfeeding policies to meet the protection guidelines according to un international labor organization so i'm going to elaborate further on to these now coming to legislative supports within the context of india now indian paid maternity leave we before 2016 to 2017 was only 12 weeks that increased from 12 weeks to 26 weeks 
which is definitely a great thing, right? And, but I also found this in WHO website. It said the organized sectors like the settled government, civil servants, organized sectors or standardized professions constitute 22.5 percentage of working mothers in comparison to non-organized who constitute 93 percentage or more. Now, although this doesn't go up to 100 percentage, but this is about people who are laborers who are working on daily wage. Definitely, isn't this, this is a disparity between organized sectors and non-organized sectors. So coming to perinatal justice, think of people who work in government sectors compared to the people who work in, I mean, in the construction zone. If they come to work, they get a pain. They don't care. But still, they are mothers. They have to breastfeed. They have to feed their children. What happens? So this is just a thought about perinatal social justice. Now, coming to paternity benef um, benefit bill, that also was simultaneously passed. But again, paternity leave is, is about two weeks, especially in central government sector. But in private sectors, it's totally, I mean, it's not quite mandated. It depends upon each employer. So now what the maternity bill offers is definitely, as I said, 26 weeks um, leave and 12 weeks beyond two children. And for up to 12 weeks leave for adoption and surrogate, surrogate parents and women to be paid 100 percentage of their wages. The other thing that this maternity bill outlines is that fresh facilities. And I can ask you, um, I'm not sure because this is not like everybody is into the webinar. It's a common hall, so I may not be able to get a, but I hope there are fresh facilities, but I did check with one of my friends in very, um, I mean, settled government institutions, they do have the fresh facilities, but how far that's effective, that's questionable, but they do have fresh facilities and it is your right if you're a breastfeeding mother, you're a leader in your organization to ask for crash facilities. Now, according to this bill, mandate, it is mandatory for employers with 30 women or 50 plus employees within 500 meters of workplace to have a crash. And paternity leave for settled government, I did mention mothers get at least four daily visits to the crash. And while, while paternity leave is there in the bill, it's not mandated. And that's one of my take. Even in Canada, we have paternity leave clubbed with parental leave. And only in Quebec, one of the provinces of the, of the all provinces, it, it does have a paid paternity leave. And that is one of my recommendation or advocacy piece in my fatherhood study. So this is about Indian context of the legislations that support breastfeeding at workplace. Now, as I said, breastfeeding is a social responsibility. I'm going back, reflecting back as I was preparing this PowerPoint this morning. I was thinking and I came across this 2015, although it's seven years past, a study by Pandey. I was thinking, how have our generations changed? My grandmother, if I ask her, definitely she would have said, I breastfed. And my mother, well, I was a preemie, she wouldn't have breastfed, but I was witnessed by my auntie who delivered at the same time her own child, my father's sister. So, well, that was acceptable, but right now that may not be that acceptable. But then, are the generations changing? Why is this important topic now? More women are coming into workforce. Compared to my grandparents, my grandparents, my mother was not a working woman. But whereas I am a working woman, by default, my daughter will definitely be a working woman. So our generations are changing. Their, their requirements are changing. The educational levels are changing. Their knowledge is changing. Now, according to this study, they interviewed, um, they did a survey on women, Indian women. In, uh, I, I guess the study is coming from Manipal. And they did a comparative study of two generations of Indian women, of women and their um, mothers or mother-in-laws. And they found that the awareness about breastfeeding issues haven't changed significantly with the educational progress of Indian women. They have excellent awareness in the society regarding breastfeeding. But 
the practice levels are less. Our percentage reflects the practice. But why? The answer is, where is the gap? Is it systemic? Is it structural? So who has to support? Again, shift your gaze from the individual responsibility to the social responsibility. Who has to support us? Our workplace has to support us. Our families have to support us. Our spouse. Yes, fathers are very, very important. And COVID has taught shared responsibility. These days, working mothers stay at home dads. There is a shift, which is normal. So changing gender norms, changing gender biases, which might be a way I mean, it might take a long time in our culture back in India, whereas here it's a total different scenario. So I was also thinking of way old. I've seen in my villages where women, they just tie the, what do you call it in Tamil, like total, right? So they tie the total in the, in the tree and they feed the babies in between their farming and when they um, do the farming. Mothers were supportive. Their workplace, the farm ground was supportive of breastfeeding. But why not now? We have moved from farm work to desk work. Again, I wouldn't say women are still working in farm grounds. Again, there's lots of disparity between rural and urban. It's the urban mothers who have less breastfeeding rates compared to farm mothers. But why? Again, so when it is desk work, who supports these mothers? Is it the culture? Is there a bias in feeding babies in common places? So these are all the questions that we need to ask ourselves, which could be barriers and challenges. So what are the common problems some mothers have expressed as, apart from the common breastfeeding challenges, breastfeeding is definitely precious, but it does not go without challenges. It is often termed natural, but if you ask the mother who has breastfeed, and if you go ask your parents, or it is definitely an overwhelming experience. It's a roller coaster experience, but it comes with a lot of effort, a lot of motivation, a lot of persistence to continue. Now, the common things that mothers have said, apart from breastfeeding challenges related to latching or other things that will come through, through physiological or um, psychological challenges, the main things that mothers have said from this national, national health survey in, in UK by um, UNICEF is that unsupportive work policies and lack of parental leave, lack of support by family and partners, lack of accessible places for feeding and pumping. So those are the things. So breastfeeding to all mothers, it's your own. It's your baby's right. It's the right of the society. So I... I can compare this experience, this journey to a fountain. To a, it's a powerful fountain of renewal for mothers. It helps physical recovery. It, of course, reduces diseases. And all the more, it increases bonding of the mother and the child. And for parents, it's an unwavering, um, un, unwavering journey of unity. It increases shared responsibility among parents and, of course, bonding among parents and inter, inter, intermarital relationship is also increased through breastfeeding. Next, through the employers, if, a, if an environment is supportive of breastfeeding, it increases loyalty of its employees. It reduces absenteeism and it, it definitely increases a positive employer brand. So I would say breastfeeding, it's a fountain that increases bonding and branding of the employer. So that's very important. So coming to practical tips for sustaining breastfeeding journey for breastfeeding mothers and all of us as health professionals who advocate for, for a working culture that is supportive of breastfeeding. It is to create a breastfeeding plan. So mothers who are returning back to work after a maternity leave, the first thing is to start expressing and storing breast milk two weeks prior to returning to work. So that's the recommendation. Not to suddenly, all of a sudden, you need to go to work next week. And this week, you want to stop the breast milk, right? Or you are planning to pump. 
This is a transitional phase. So during this transition phase, you need to give at least two weeks to transition back into the workforce. So before that, and how to continue breastfeeding despite returning back to work. So developing a pumping schedule. So this is an important plan that needs to be created by each and every breastfeeding mother. Next thing is to communicate with your employer, informing your employer. It could be your manager. It could be your, um, your principal. It could be your, um, I mean, whoever is concerned, your higher authority to tell them, this is what I'm going to do. I'm returning back. Yes, I have to breastfeed my baby. That's my goal. And so when they know, they have to support you. Discuss the needs for breaks. Discuss the needs for a private space. And to invest in a good breast pump. So definitely India, we are not far from North America. Most companies provide insurances. Yes. And it's always a good investment to get a best I mean, get a good breast pump. So the key word is, it's not the company of choice, it's double electric pump. So that's more important. And to practice before you get back to work. So those are the little things as steps to stride through the strides of the whirlwind of, see, this raft person is just navigating the rapids of the balance of the river that flows through him. So same thing, a mother who returns to work has to guide herself, navigate through the, through the challenges and to continue her journey of breastfeeding. Now, all about pumping. So this is where I come and I, unfortunately, I'm sorry. So the name shows, I tried to remove that, but anyways. So double electric pump. The first picture shows a double electric hospital grade pump. And this is a very, um, I mean, handy double electric pump. This is another type of double electric pump. This is a single swing electric pump. And I'm sure you have seen hand pumps. We do not recommend hand pumps for initial, for long-term mothers, especially mothers when they move to work, get back to work. The reason is that the hand pumps take a lot of toll on your and one. Next, the effectiveness of the vacuum or the suction, the push and the pull pressure is not enough. It does not mimic the baby's sucking effect and thereby it cannot maintain milk supply. So highly recommended are double electric pumps. So these are some of the examples and these are the ones that we have in our units and it depends upon um, these are hospital grades which are present in our NICUs and our mother baby units. Now we have and we have a pumping kit. It could be a tote bag, any bag that you have. And we have a pump pump kit that goes with the pumping um, machine. All mothers can get, they can borrow the um, borrow the pump kit to take home for four dollars per day, which comes around 200 rupees. But then those are work-friendly or our mother-friendly um, initiatives in our units. Then we have a clean bag to clean the parts. We have a breastfeeding log to log the amount of milk pumped. We have milk storage bags and we have a brush to clean the parts. So you can put together your pump kit, which you can take to your workplace. If you have a cupboard, you can request for a cupboard or a special space in your drawer as a working person. You can place this kit in that spot for yourself or you have um, um, feeding friendly spaces. You can keep those kits. The next thing is you can see cleaning the pump parts. The press pump kit cleaning is goes, so hand washing goes per se before every procedure. So it's the same thing that you teach the mothers, uh, irrespective of whether they are professionals, non-professionals. Now, after every use, we have to store the milk safely. The storage can go up to inside the fridge, in the fridge, um, back, back of the fridge, or it could go to the freezer. And when you clean the pump parts, the flanges have to, cleaned, uh, to be cleaned under the faucet. Then you could use the brush 
to clean the parts and rinse them well in soap water and then clean water. So that's what uh, is recommended by CDC. And after you clean, you have to place the parts and dry them thoroughly on a wet tissue or a clean cloth. Or you can also clean in dishwashers as available. And after cleaning, you could sanitize them uh, to remove extra germs, especially this is for preemie babies. And you have to store it in a Tupperware after you remove the extra moisture. So this is about the, and, um, the storage, I'm mean, sorry, the cleaning of the breast parts, I mean, pump parts. So coming to the other things we use is um, by some companies, you can also get them in Amazon, uh, the quick clean micro steam bag. So what we recommend our moms while they are in the hospitals or even for our nurses who pump is that they have this micro steam bags. So what they do is inside these breast, I mean, um, inside this micro steam bags, they place the breast shields after washing. And then we have a separate microwave, which is only for sterilization of pumping equipments. So they sterilize it. Um, so they place the clean parts and they sterilize for up to one or uh, one and a half minutes. And to prevent any skulls, we have some microwave mittens, which they use to take them out and start using it as needed. So that's how friendly the work culture, and this could be improvised in, in institutions accordingly. Now coming to storage and location, this is another common question. Yes, I've got a pump. I, I know how to clean it and I know how to sterilize it. Well, if you don't have, uh, I mean, if you don't have a microwave, you could also take two, three parts and take it to your office in the um, pump uh, tote bag. And then you could, at home, you can bring these parts after you pump and you can boil it in boiling water for up to 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, rolling boiling water. It's the same thing that we teach our community health. When we go to community health nursing, we teach our parents how to sterilize the bottles. It, it's similar to that. Okay. So coming to storage, this is very common. I always go by, when I teach my class in my unit for my parents, what I tell them is, remember the good rule of four to six. Four to six hours room temperature. Four to six days refrigerator. Four to six months double door freezer. Well, you could ask me, well, compared to Canada, it's, it's very icy, it's very cold. Compared to India, we are temperate, we are humid. Yes, so the chart that I have here is for temperatures. So all that is needed is temperature should be 25 degrees centigrade. So I will remove that six hours and I move down to four hours. So breast milk, if it is there, as soon as you pump, it is there and you can feed your baby, then it, it should be up to four hours in the countertop. If you put that into the refrigerator, it can go up to four days. In freezers, it can go up to six months and it can be placed for 12 months. So, and once you put that into the freezer, it comes down from freezer to refrigerator, refrigerator back to the countertop. So you thaw, like you thaw the food, frozen food. So thawed previously frozen milk, it can stay in the countertop for one to two hours and in refrigerator up to one day. And it's always nice not to return back Anything that comes out doesn't go back. So that rule is golden. Next, leftover from feeding, use within two hours after. So the key is always, as soon as you pump, before storing, label the breast milk containers with your name and the date so that you use the fresh, I mean, you use the first pumped ones prior to the next, the, the later ones. So that's what it is. Now, this is an example of a milk warmer that we have in our unit. And these are the tiny little fridges we have in our breastfeeding rooms. And this is an example of the bottles where you pump. You can have an ice pack in between. So it's exactly same like the we carry the vaccine carrier bags when we carry to the community. So similar insulated coolers you can carry to your workplace until you come back. Now you work for eight hours or 12 hour shifts. I know nurses work 12 hours um, and most people work eight hours. So depending upon your shifts. So within eight hours, at least three to four hours, once in three to four hours, you have to pump. 
So it's the demand and supply. The more you pump, the often you pump, the more the milk comes in. So that's key. That is the schedule that needs to be consistent. So that's very, very important. Now coming to myths and facts about storing milk. So the common myth is you can't store breast milk at room temperature in India. Well, not really. It can be safely stored at room temperature for up to four hours. Expressing milk by hand is less ex effective than using a pump. Yes, we want stylish and we want, um, what to say, vibrant things or oh, something. Pump, as soon as I put, I, I see this here also. Do you think if I put my pump immediately, milk will come? Not really. We are just stimulating the milk supply, right? So hands are better than, it's. it has that, uh, touch feel right and it is easier and it's cost effective compared to pumping so but hand expressions are more for the initial days and when there is very severe engorgement where you cannot uh, latch the baby or where you cannot use the pump because of the taut breast so hand expressions are as effective as using breast pump. I'll talk about it shortly. You can't mix freshly pumped milk with refrigerated milk. That's another myth. Freshly expressed milk can be combined with refrigerated milk unless you have done both of them within that four hour period. Now, adding sugar or water to breast milk will improve its taste. Breast milk by itself has everything except vitamin D, right? So it does have all the sweet that babies would love to taste. And breast milk turns bad if it separates or changes color. Now the significant thing that I want to tell is that once mother starts storing milk, what happens? The milk is very rich in lipids. The fat and the water, they separate. So mothers think, or usually parents think, that it is still. The milk is stale. It is not. It's the lipid and the water that separates. So only thing you have to swirl it around before you really take it out to feed your baby. So that's what it is. So it's normal for breast milk to separate into layers or change color. Another thing is there are milk that is green. Milk can turn um, purple. Uh, the beetroot color. So if a mother has had beetroot or some sort of vegetables, the breast milk can come turn into that color and you can still feed the milk. So breast milk that shows difference in colors is normal. It's liquid gold. It's normal to feed the breast milk that is stored that shows difference in colors unless it doesn't smell perfect. There is a very peculiar odor to the milk uh, which is not acceptable. Then you have to think of it. So those are the little tips or myths and facts because mostly grandmoms, Indian grandmoms, especially when they when I see them, South Asian, they say that really can we store the milk? Um, I'm, not, I'm not getting the Tamil, the sentences that they say. Uh, it's not at all good to give uh, Simba, right? That is cholesterol. The next thing is they say storing milk, how can we give? It is old milk. Not really, right? So these are all the myths that we have in our culture where grandparents, they are great, but sometimes there are influences as well, which can deter. Now, hand expression kits, I would like to show this. If you can see, this is a hand expression kit that we have in our unit. So this is the card that we give our parents. And hand expression is great when we do it early in the breastfeeding journey. So you can see here, hand expression is um, using the hand, the mother presses on the areola and pushes behind and brings the milk out and collects in the cup. So she collects, so we have the kit with cups and spoons. So we recommend our moms to collect in the cups from the hand express milk and then feed through the cup or we do have some um, syringes, these are 0.1 ml. Um, so it's 1 ml, right? Each line is 0.1, similar to our insulin syringes. So we have breastfeeding syringes in this kit. For mothers who have more breast milk, second, third day, we give them 3 ml syringes like this. These are present in pharmacies. 
these are similar to the injections that we have. Those are white in color, but these are breastfeeding syringes. And we have some lids to close. So this is how mothers store the milk. I mean, they collect the milk and they give it to their babies or they can put it in the tote bag and take it home. So this is for initial days of breastfeeding. But hand expression is very good for mothers, especially imagine you're feeling full. The common challenge is that a mother, when she returns back to work, is that one thing is suddenly she feels full, she feels heavy, can get engorged if she's unable to breast pump. Um, to pump. So... What she can do is in that instant, she can use her hand. So that's when hand expression comes, irrespective of the time that has passed from the initial to six months or two years. Whenever the mother feels full, if she doesn't have a pump, she can do hand expressions and collect the milk and store it in the stereotypes. Or you can take it in palada and give it when you're at home. Or you can put it in a small container that you take to bring it home and give it to your baby. So immediate relief of engorgement of the breast, applying a warm compress, massaging the breast and expressing the milk in a cup and collecting it in the syringe. So hand expressions, but to maintain and to pump after you return back to work is definitely a breast pump. That's more important. So. So that's about hand expression kits. Now coming to role of employers in enabling breastfeeding. So this is one of the breastfeeding rooms that we have in our unit. We have couches and we have everything that the parents have. So there were some, I mean, I cannot reveal certain things that I did not really capture just to avoid um, for privacy reasons. So this is one of the mother's um, was consented to use in our teaching rooms. So she pumps the comfortable chair to sit down and pump and all the information pamphlets. So establishing breastfeeding friendly policies within the units. So that's very, very important. So you need to check in your institution, what are the breastfeeding friendly policies that are available for parents? So as mothers, working mothers, working students, your working staff. So what are the breastfeeding friendly policies that are available in the unit that align with the maternity um, act? Maternal uh, paid leave is one of that. Flexible work arrangements is another. Educating and training all the leaders in the unit. So training managers and staff. Providing access to lactation rooms. That's very, very important. If in your university you don't have one, advocate for one room at least to start with. Access to lactation rooms that are friendly, that have at least a um, couch for the mother to sit down. Some resources, offering flexible work arrangements. What do you mean by work arrangements? These days people can work um, from home, hybrid work arrangements, right? So people, if they can work from home, most IT jobs, they can work from home. So that can be there. Um, breastfeeding mothers can come a little late to work and go late from work. Or they can work four hours and get back to bed, get back home and they can compensate the remaining six hours. They can do, um, I mean, at desk work at home. So those flexible work arrangements and fostering support to workplace culture. I was hearing the other day, uh, last week, I think, in, in lieu of World Breastfeeding Week, there was a panel discussion. This is in one of the hospitals in India. From my friend, I heard they had a panel discussion among nurses and nursing faculty to talk about how friendly their work culture is. And one of the key things that came up was their colleagues are not supportive. They ridicule them. They do not give them breaks. They do not Accept they really look down on them if they are going to pump. So, so support to workplace culture. Peer support is very, very important for breastfeeding mothers. So that is where we are a society. That's where is our strength to uphold each other. Encouraging peer support and networking. Next, partnering with breastfeeding advocacy groups in and around your community areas, 
right? So start from where we are, who we are, okay, and expand it. So start from the nursing unit, then start from the college, then go to the hospitals, then go to your other departments in, um, in um, I'm not, so in your university, right? So that's what it is. And having meetings to share success stories, probably after this, the next year, we, we don't know what is the uh, theme of um, World Breastfeeding Week. Having mothers who are breastfeeding, if you have started as an evaluation to share the success stories, as I shared my own st story today, starting off this presentation, and all the more, as a father advocate, I would say support the fathers. Fathers are equally important. If they have a new baby, they need care too. Paternal mental health is increasing by two in 10 fathers to one in 10 mothers. They are paralleling these days. Of course, COVID has given us great examples and it has added our mental health burden too. So maternal mental health, paternal mental health in turn affects the infant well-being, growth and development of our child, and in turn our future generations and our children. So the employers, the leaders, peers, play a very vital role in supporting breastfeeding mothers at work as they return back to work. Now, this is one of the examples of an infant feeding room. So infant feeding room should have an entrance with a clear caption. Lactation rooms, depending upon, that, depending upon the number of women who might become pregnant, you can take a needs assessment in your university. How many people, on an average, can go in a year on a maternity leave. How many of them are returning back? So depending on that, you can have lactation rooms. Changing area for the mothers if they need to. Next is having running water. Well, we definitely have water concerns. This may not apply globally, but then as much as we can, right? We could improvise our sanitary facilities. Then storage facilities, having a small refrigerator and information displays with all the resources for the mothers to read or any magazines to relax and pump while they, uh, while they are pumping, having a television in that room to watch. Well, I might, um, it depends upon each university and the capacity to improvise. Little is better than nothing at all. That's my uh, take on it. So it's unique how we can cater, but at least we have to cater to our working mothers. Child-friendly areas for second-time mothers, third-time mothers. Sometimes they can bring their babies, especially in the hospitals when they are coming as pregnant mothers. They are bringing their toddlers with them. They can have some crayons for the toddlers to play while the mother is pumping and having hygienic products and cleaning equipments. So those are the little things and uh, security and privacy for the mothers while they Pump. So these days I see our airports, our malls are baby friendly, are family friendly. So that's a great move. So we are transforming work, not only workplaces, we are transforming all our common areas into baby friendly areas. So breastfeeding accommodations in the workplace. So highest successful examples. Well, this is um, from the from our Google friend, okay? So academic institutions in India. So common institutions that I came up in my Google search were IIT, IIM, Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, Pune University and St. Xavier's. But the list is not, is exhaustive, it doesn't end here. Um, in Tamil Nadu, of course, Anna University, Bharatiyar University, Madras University, uh, VIT, they have uh, friendly, breastfeeding uh, lactation rooms and breastfeeding accommodations and almost all IT companies, I haven't listed them. Um, they are friendly in terms of breastfeeding accommodations that are available. So I would say, why not are uh, hospitals friendly? We are the ones who are teaching, but I doubt how much working nurses, working doctors, working pediatricians are supported in the workplace. Do they have a separate room? Definitely bathrooms or not separate rooms. Bathrooms are different. These rooms are separate apart from bathrooms. Never ever 
tell anybody to go and pump in the bathroom. No, never ever tell anybody to collect the milk in the bathroom. Bathroom is not a safe and safe and clean place to do pumping or store milk. So this has to be very, very accommodative for the breastfeeding mothers. So how can we do things differently in 2023? Definitely let our businesses, let our workplaces become baby friendly, family friendly. So focus on recognition and succession of these practices year after. Let it start now if it is not there. But if it's there, let it continue. Measuring our impacts and benefits after we introduce certain things. So talk to all the women in your organization at all levels, irrespective of high level, middle level, low level, to anybody in the unit, from our workers, from our helpers, from our supports. Everybody has to be interviewed as a needs assessment. Focus groups and interviews. And after we install lactation rooms, work, I mean, lactation friendly rooms and policies, check how these facilities are utilized. Not just creating a room and leaving it there and we don't know how many people use it, how effective it is. Checking the breastfeeding rates among these women after our policies are, are inst instilled into the system. Employee retention and satisfaction among the mothers who return back after as breastfeeding mothers and increasing awareness and education of breastfeeding friendly policies. When you're hiring a person, tell them our workplace is very supportive for breastfeeding. Yes, so that's what is important. So you, my dear students, when you start as nurses, ask your nursing dean who hires you whether that place is breastfeeding friendly when you are becoming parents, both our fathers and mothers to be impact on employee productivity. So those are the things that I had outlined from what I thought of. And so I have various resources in my PowerPoint. Um, where to get pumps according to your need. Each one's need is unique in terms of affordability, accessibility. Some might have great insurances, some might not, some might have to pay, but it's a great investment. So that's about the various resources and fueling the future breastfeeding for brighter tomorrows. So prioritizing on investments and the political will within families. Family is a political area too, yes? So especially in our culture, we have this gender politics. So it's not the mother's responsibility, it's, it's the father and the mother. We are a tag team and our grandparents, our society. So to support families in their breastfeeding journey. So finally, I did find the Tamil version of the theme. So Thai Palutale, Satya Makuvo, Lekum Pengalikka Matrine, Epaditurum. Thank you.